Well, she became more and more desperate, but she didn't hear from her because her relatives that lived in Los Angeles never responded. And they didn't respond because they hadn't heard from this young man. And she didn't hear from him again until he returned in a wooden coffin. Back to Jalisco, the state of Jalisco, when he died crossing the border. And she says she cannot, you know, she cannot get over this, this tragic death. And that letter is a very moving letter. It's on our website. So when you leave today, you're going to get a flyer. And on the flyer, there's, there's our website address. And you can see that letter. You can see some of the interviews that I've had, like with the O'Reilly Factor and crazy people like that, or with Don Francisco or Larry King. And you can also see this letter. It's a very moving letter. And I gave that letter to Mana. And Mana wrote a very a popular song called Pobre Juan, which is partially based on that letter. So for us, it's very important that we get the word out there about what is really happening with immigration. What is really happening on the border? So Border Rangers started putting water out there. And that uh, show, when I was on that show in 2001, it was Don Francisco that said, El Angel de la Frontera, the Border Angel. And that's how we got our name. Although I told him, I don't want to be called the Border Angel, but that's a good name for the group. So we, we were named Border Angels, thanks to Don Francisco. And we went from a very small group of about 50 people to about 2,000 people. Now we have a group of about 2,000. We're an all-volunteer group. And one of the things that, that we do, besides putting water in the desert, besides going to the canyons, we have mass there every Sunday morning, for example. We have a little makeshift chapel in the canyons. We go to the, where the day laborers are, the, the guys that are standing around working, because the people that are crossing are coming here for two reasons. 80, about 80% 80 of them are coming here for economic opportunity. They want to be able to work. They want to be able to send money back home. They want to be able to survive. 80% of the people. The other 20%, there's always exceptions, but in general, the other 20%, family reunification. They already have a relative living here. Like Marco Antonio Villaseñor, he was in the 80%. His dad had a job lined up here. Lucrecia Dominguez, she was in the 20%. Her husband lived here. She wanted to, to unify with her husband. And these people, the biggest myth that's out there, I have no problem with immigration. They should just you know, get in line. That's the biggest myth because there is no line. For people of that socioeconomic level that, that make very little money, they cannot get a visa. There is no visa for them. So either they starve to death wherever they're from, because unlike what you hear on Ken and John and some of these shows, these people aren't all from Mexico. They come from different parts of the world. Most Mexicans, 95% of the population of Mexico, which is about 115 million people, has no desire to come here, and they don't, unless they want to go shopping or visit friends. But the, that, that small percentage that comes here is because they're desperate. They're looking for opportunity. They want to be with their family. They want to get a job. There's 250 million undocumented people in the world. Most don't come here. They go to other countries. So there's a lot of misinformation out there. There's a lot of myths out there. Those undocumented people, they don't pay taxes. We've all heard that. They don't pay taxes. When was the last time any of you went to a store and yourselves or somebody in front of you was speaking another language, like let's say Spanish, and the clerk says, oh, I notice you're speaking Spanish. Are you documented or undocumented? Because if you're undocumented, you don't have to pay taxes and all that stuff. Never. Those undocumented people, they're only here for the benefits. When was the last time you saw a Latino on a corner with a sign that says, we'll work for food? You don't see it. And if you do, I bet you they were born here. You go to the Home Depot or certain areas, and there's 50 of them standing there. But they're really standing there for work. You know, they come around your car. You know, they're, they're coming here for work. Those people. They only want to speak their own language and hang out in their own neighborhoods and wave their own flags. That was Benjamin Franklin talking about Germans. So this type of discrimination has been going on, not only here, it happens in other countries too, but it's been going on since the beginning of this country. Now, none of us here have ever heard there's too many Germans in this country. But there was a time. There was too many Germans, too many Polish, too many Italians, etc. Now it happens to be too many people that speak Spanish. So this has been going on, even though we were already here, of course. But this has been going on since the beginning of this country, and it's important that we know the truth about this situation. The migrants that come here, they add to the security and the value system of this country. There's 11 million undocumented people in the country today, according to the US Census. A third of them actually did qualify for, for being able to get a visa, and they got a visa. Those aren't people from Latin America. Those are mainly people from Europe and from Asia that come from wealthier families that got a student visa, a work visa, or a tourist visa. And they stay. Their visa expired and they stayed. So they're undocumented. The other two thirds don't qualify for visa. Those are the ones risking their lives, crossing in the desert, hiding in the trunk of a car, etc. So Border Angels is out there talking about the realities and the myths. We have some brochures out there. And on the brochure, it has this section called myths. 
so that you know the truth about the immigration debate, the truth about who we are, who we all are. Because we're all, like I said, of the, of the same race, the human race. So for me, it's very important that people know the truth. And what has happened when they want to attack a community is they try to dehumanize our communities, our respective communities. They try to make it sound like we're less than. You've seen that there's been a, a terrible spike in bullying and in hate crimes in this country. There was a young girl, in, in not too long ago, that came from Ireland and she went to school in, in, in Boston, Massachusetts. And she went to school and she was the girl, like the guy, but in this case it was a girl that was always picked on. She was picked on and they would say, you Irish this and you Irish that. She couldn't take it anymore. So one day, 15-year-old Phoebe Prince just didn't show up at school. They wondered, what happened to Phoebe? How come she didn't show up at school? 15 years old. She committed suicide. She couldn't take it anymore. And that's what's happening more and more and more. You have a case of Luis Ramirez, a 20-year-old young man that was walking down the street in Shenandoah, Pennsylvania. And these three good white kids, and you know that most people, white, brown, black, or blue, are good. But these three good, according to the paper, three good white kids decided to kill a Mexican that day. They found Luis Ramirez, and they didn't like him because, first of all, he was Mexican like me, but secondly, his wife was American, blonde, right? They had a couple of kids. So he's walking down the street by himself, and these three kids, they literally beat the living daylights out of him, yelling all these racist epithets as they beat him and killed him. So I went to Shenandoah, Pennsylvania, and they had a trial for these kids, and they said, those were good kids. They, they were just having a bad day. And I said, if, if those, if those uh, kids that had beat up a, a white kid would have been African-American or Latino kids, I'm sure that they, they never would have said that. Those were good kids having a bad day. So this is outrageous. This is outrageous. So we were able to get MALDEF, the Mexican-American Legal Education Fund, to take it to a higher court. The three kids are in prison now for killing this, this young man, Luis Ramirez. Marcelo Lucero was a young man walking down the street of Long Island, New York, where these seven good kids, supposedly, decided to have a beaner boot party. They wanted to find a Mexican and kick him to death. And they found Marcelo walking down the street, and they did kick him to death. He wasn't Mexican. He was from Ecuador. So we went there to have a vigil for, for Marcelo Lucero. His mom and sister flew all the way from Ecuador and said, why are you doing this for us? And I said, because the United States is a great country with great values and great people. What these seven kids did, or like the three kids in Shenandoah, is not reflective of these countries, of, of this country. And we did a prayer vigil for the seven in, in Long Island and the three in Shenandoah. And they said, why are you doing a prayer vigil for the people that perpetrated the crimes? Of course, we did one for the victims, too. And they said, and I said, we're praying for these people because those kids were not born that way. Something happened along the way. When you see children, you know, the innocence of children, you know, playing amongst each other and so forth, they don't care what the color of the skin is or the language. They, you know, they just want to enjoy the company of a fellow human being. But something happens along the way where some people go in the wrong direction, and that's what happened to these kids. So Border Angels has a very active program with the Southern Poverty Law Center talking about teaching tolerance and how sometimes, and it, it happened at St. Augustine High School, where all of a sudden you want to pick on a particular individual, and instead of doing something about it, you join in. You join in because you want to be in with that in crowd. And you don't know how horrific it is for that person that's being picked on and, and how terrible it is. And you don't know if he's going to end up like Phoebe Prince. I was giving a talk one time, and this guy comes up to me, and he was really emotional when I was talking. And he goes, I was really moved by your talk. And, and he goes, I also give talks. And I go, well, yeah, what, what do you talk about? And he goes, I'm an insurance salesman. And I thought, oh, brother, this is going to be really boring, insurance. And I go, oh, wow, that's interesting. I go, so, so what do you talk about in insurance? And he goes, well, I talk about my story. I was born in Kansas. And when I went to school in Kansas, in the high school I went to, I was the kid that was always picked on. And my senior year, my senior year, I had just about had it. And I go to school, and, and, and the kids would knock the books out of my hand and spit on me and beat me up. But one day when I was going home, my parents weren't home, and the biggest bully in the school lived on my block, and he sees me. So he comes up to me, and he goes, hey, Joe, I, hear, I heard you have a stamp collection. I'd like to see it. So I thought for sure the bully was going to rip up my stamp collection or whatever. So they go inside Joe's house, because his parents weren't home, and he looks at the stamp collection. And the bully really did like stamps. And he goes, this is a really neat collection. And he admired it, and they had a you know, good time that evening. And then the bully went home. Well, the next day, when, when Joe goes to school, he thinks he has a new friend. The bully is going to protect him. So he's walking towards his locker, and he sees the group of people making fun of him, and the bully's right there. And the bully is worse than ever. 
Worse than ever, he initiates, you know, throwing the kid down and all this. And I go, Joe, that's a really sad story. And he goes, no, for me, that was a life-saving story. And I go, what are you talking about? And he said, the day that I was going home, when the bully came into my house to see my stamp collection, was the day that I had decided to commit suicide. And the only reason I didn't commit suicide was because the bully was there. And that evening, while the bully was looking at my stamp collection, I saw hope. I saw that this guy wasn't such a bad guy when he was by himself. When he was with his friends, for whatever insecure reason, he, he needed the proof that he was tough, he acted differently. But that was enough to inspire me to graduate tops in my high school. Then I went to a fine college, and now I'm a you know, very successful insurance salesman. And I said, now Joe, now that's a, very, that's a great story. I mean, it's a sad, but it's a very powerful story. And he goes, that's not the end of it. He goes, one day I was giving a lecture to all the top insurance people in the country, and I was the top guy. And all of a sudden, this guy in the crowd starts crying. And he comes up to me, and he goes, hey, did you go to Jefferson High School in Kansas City? And he goes, yes, I did. How did you know that? And he goes, I was the bully. I never realized I had affected you that way. I never realized what you were going through. And now the two people, the bully and, and, and Joe, travel around the country talking about the chance of, of overcoming these types of obstacles. The redemption. We have all made mistakes. You could do the right thing. And I remember, I'm going to wrap it up here so we can do some questions. But I remember a guy came to my school and gave, gave a talk. And it really inspired me. His grandfather is, should be the hero to everybody in this room. You all have heard of him. His grandfather is Mahatma Gandhi. So his grandson, Ravi, comes to my school, the University of San Diego, to give a school, to give a talk. And Ravi's giving this talk, and it's about a man, and you may have heard this story, it's about a man walking along the beach with his son, and his son is picking up these starfish, and he's throwing these starfish into the ocean. So the father's walking along, and he goes, son, what are you doing? Why are you throwing all those starfish into the ocean? And he goes, dad, these starfish are dying. It's so hot out here. The sun and the, the tide has gone in. These starfish are dying. And the father looks at his son and he goes, yes, I can see that the starfish are dying. And I can see that you're, you're picking these starfish up, but what you do does not make any difference. And the little boy picks up a starfish and he shows it to his father and he says, it'll make a difference to this one. In other words, saving one life at a time. You're saving that one life. You, you might not realize that the impact, it, had somebody been there for Joe earlier, had somebody been there for Phoebe Prince, or Luis Ramirez, or Marcelo Lucero, maybe it would have been a different outcome. Two weeks after I heard that story, two weeks after, I'm in the desert, putting water out there like we do the Border Angels, and I'm with another volunteer, we're an all-volunteer group, and all of a sudden we see this guy walking along the desert, which is very rare because usually they walk at night, and the day is too hot, unless they're in real trouble. He was in real trouble. And as we pull over and go running over towards him, I realize that it's two guys. The other guy is carrying one, a guy on his back, so we give him water, we put him under some trees, one guy's about to die, I'm going to take him to the hospital. We stayed with him for about three hours. And thank God, and, and God only, they recover. They recover. And we have to go on and put more water, right? So all of a sudden, two weeks later, I'm at, I'm at Qualcomm Stadium, that's where the Padres used to play, and I get a call. And it's a little boy, and he goes, hi sir, you don't know me, but my name is Francisco. And my dad told me you saved his life two weeks ago in the Imperial Valley. And I go, holy cow, where are you calling me from? And he goes, from Los Angeles. I live in Los Angeles. My dad went back to bury my grandmother. And he came back to the desert because he's the only breadwinner in the family. And I said, that's incredible. I go, how's the man that your father was helping? And he said, what man? I go, your dad didn't tell you? Your dad was carrying, that guy was a stranger? He was carrying a stranger on his back through the desert? That's my new hero, this Francisco guy that lives someplace here in Los Angeles. And I go, God bless you and so forth. Remember, I had just heard the starfish story two weeks earlier. Well, another two weeks go by and I get another call. It was Pedro, the man on the back's son. The guy that was on his back, the guy that was really hurt. And he was calling me from Chicago. So when people say, Enrique, do you think that what Border Angels does makes a difference? I say, I have no idea. But I know it made a difference to Francisco and Pedro.